not. So if you have not already made a donation to superheroes and you are able to do so, we would very much appreciate it. So this is a non-profit organisation, um, meaning that all of the help that we provide to children, young people and their families uh, comes about because of kind donations from people like you and the funding that we receive to be able to run events like these webinars. So again, with the link that comes out to you to, uh, tomorrow with all of the other previous webinars that you'll be able to see as well as a recap of this one there will be a uh, link to our donation page where uh, you can give however much you might want to um, as little as 50 pounds goes towards providing sessions for a child or young person so you know see what you can do every little helps as they say all righty i think we're ready to rock and roll so i have got i've got 10 questions for you today but i've also got potentially a bonus question to throw into the mix as well so let us get started today it is a quiz about self-harm this is not a joyful topic to quiz about as i'm sure you well know but I'll try and make this as at least as interesting and as educational as I possibly can. All right, so question number one is, uh, between 2018 and 2019, and I picked these years because that's back when the world was sort of functioning in a slightly more normal way. There was no point in giving you more recent stats because it's been locked down. So between 2018 and 2019, what percentage of child lines calls related to self-harm okay so between 2018 and 2019 what percentage of child lines calls related to self-harm i'm going to give you some choices so we have option a is between 30 and 40 percent option b is between 20 and 30 percent Option C is between 10 and 20% of all the calls to child line relating to self-harm. And option D is less than 10% of calls to child line related to self-harm. All right, so what do you think? Okay, so question number two is, what is trichotillomania? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to spell it for you. So it is T R I C H O T I L L I O L M A N I A. Okay, so what is trichlo, uh, trichotillomania? Trichotillomania. <laughs> all right big long word um okay question number three. Oh, and by the way obviously question number two relates to something to do with self-harm okay okay question number three uh, what area of the body is most likely and this is for boys and girls okay so which area of the body is most likely to be the site the physical site where self-harm takes place so i'm going to give you some options we have got a arms b legs c face or d chest okay what area of the body is most likely to be the site of self-harm or key Question number four, uh, what is not a common classification for self-harm? So I'm gonna give you four different types of self-harm. One of them is not commonly referred to as a type of self-harm, all right? So the question is, which one is not a common classification for self-harming? So we've got A, burning, B, self-poisoning, C, jumping in a way that causes injury, and D, insomnia. All right, so which one of those is not a common 
classification for self-harm. A, burning, uh, so deliberate burning of themselves. Um, B, self-poisoning. C, jumping in a way that causes injury. Or D, insomnia. All right. Uh, then we've got question number five. Okay, so the comorbidity of self-harm with other mental health conditions is thought to be high. Is that true or false? All right, so comorbidity simply meaning um, the existence of other disorders being there. So the comorbidity of self-harm with other mental health conditions is thought to be high. Would you say that that is true or is that false? All right, uh, question number six. And um, you can medicate to help prevent self-harm. Is that true or is that false? All right, you can medicate to help prevent self-harm. Question number seven, another true or false, uh, diet can help prevent self-harm. Okay, what do you think diet? Diet can help prevent self-harm. Do you think that is true or is that false? All right, question number eight, uh, also a true or false. Um, are those who self-harm at a greater risk of suicide? Okay, so think very carefully about the wording on this question. Are those who uh, self-harm at a greater risk of suicide? All right. Uh, in fact, it's not a true or false, is it? It's a yes or no. <laughs> yes, they are, or no, they're not. Question number nine. Is self-harming conceptualised as an addiction? All right, so question number nine. Is self-harming conceptualised as an addiction? So A, yes, B, no. And then question number 10 is, what does NSSI stand for? So I've got four options for you here. So NSSI is the uh, acronym. A is non-suicidal self-injury. B is negative self-sabotage injuries. C is navus scars self-inflicted. And D is non-scarring self-injury. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't read my writing then. Uh, so non-scarring self-injury is option D. All right, so those are your 10 questions. I'll give you the bonus question once I've whizzed back through these 10. So question number one, um, and by the way, as I whiz back through them, if there's any that you want me to go back to again, you've got a chat box facility available. So if there's any that you need me to repeat, then make sure you fire them over in the chat box after I've gone through them again now. All right, so question number one, uh, was between 2018 and 2019, what percentage of child lines calls related to self-harm? A was 30 to 40 percent, B was 20 to 30 percent, C was 10 to 20 percent, and D was less than 10 percent. Uh, question two is, what is trichotillomania? Question three, what areas of the body are most likely to be the sites of self-harm? Um, and uh, this is for girls and boys. So we had A, arms, B, legs, C, face, 
D chest. Question four is, which is not a common classification for self-harm? A, burning. B, self-poisoning. C, jumping in a way to cause injury. Or D, insomnia. Question five. The comorbidity of self-harm with other mental health conditions is thought to be high. Is that true or false? Question six was, you can medicate to help prevent self-harm, true or false? Question seven, diet can help prevent self-harm, true or false? Question eight, um, are those who self-harm at a greater risk of suicide? So we're gonna say A, yes, or B, no. Question nine is, is self-harming conceptualized as an addiction? So A, yes, or B, no. And question 10 was what does NSSI stand for? So A is non-suicidal self-injury. B is negative self-sabotage injuries. C is navus scars self-inflicted. And D is non-scarring self-injuries. All right, so your bonus question, question 11, is does the severity of the self-harm indicate a worse condition? Thank you to Ian for this question, <laughs> which I spent quite a bit of time doing some research on. All right, so does the severity indicate a worse condition? Uh, so it's an A, yes, or a B, no. All right, so if there's any of those that you need a repeat on, speak now, because the next stage is I'm going to go through them again and give you the answers, as well as some extra distinctions on some of them as to why the answers are what the answers are. All right, any that we need repeats on? No? Okay. So then, let's go back to question number one. Uh, which was between 2018 and 2019, what percentage of child lines calls related to self-harm? The answer is D, less than 10%. It's actually only 6%, which tells us that there is not much self-harm being self-reported because six percent is pretty low in actual fact the number of um young people that do self-harm is around one to two in 15 that are self-harming so in your average classroom say you've probably got a good couple of people in there that are self-harmers um, so, uh, which is, is obviously a greater percentage. So it seems that self-harm is quite high as an issue, but the reaching out and asking for help doesn't mirror that. All right, so question number two, what is trichotillomania? That is hair pulling. Okay, so literally pulling the hair out and it can be head hair, it can be eyebrows, it can be eyelashes, which makes me feel a little funny inside. <sighs> um, so I first came across this before I was even working as a therapist. I was actually a community nursery nurse uh, for the NHS. And I worked with a family where they had, she really wasn't much more than a toddler. I think she was coming up for three. Um, and as a baby, she had twizzled her hair as a kind of self, self soothing habit. Um, but she would do it as she was falling off to sleep and twizzled it so much that it had caused a bald, you know, sort of thinning patch of hair on one side. Um, and when she was obviously very little, it didn't really matter too much because she didn't have too much hair anyway. But now she was going to be going off to preschool. Um, it, you know, it, it was quite obvious that something there wasn't right. In addition, when she became more stressed and anxious, 
she would not just sort of twizzle and pull out the hair, she would also eat it. Um, and that's less common. Um, so that starts then to relate to something called pica, which you also might have heard of. And that is when um, somebody has a habit of ingesting inorganic objects. So sometimes it might be things like the fluff out of a cushion or the sponge in the sofa. Um, and they develop almost a bit of a sort of craving and addiction. Uh, Frank, does ha does having uh, does having something to do with hair count? Yes, I'm going to give you that. <laughs> you can have that one because you you did good to spot the the technical word for hair in there. So I'm going to give you that one. Um, yes. Yeah, so sometimes we might see that that hair pulling also turns into the ingesting of hair, and that can actually then get super dangerous because if you end up with a bit of a nest of hair inside your tummy, then that can cause all sorts of digestive issues. And there's cases where people have actually had to have an operation to then have that, that ball of hair removed from their stomach. So that's what trichotillomania mania is all about. All right, so what area of the body is most likely to be the uh, site of harm? So this is for boys and girls. Um, although it does then sort of splinter off and go in slightly different directions. So we had A, arms, B, legs, C, face, or D, chest. And the answer is A for arms. Um, so for both boys and girls, arms are the area that are most likely to be the site that uh, they cause injury to. And I can actually give you some stats here. So in uh, females, it's 8.5. Uh, sorry, 85.5 percent of the time um, that the arms would be the site of harm. In boys, for arms, it's 76.7 percent. Um, then for both, it goes to uh, legs next. So for females, it's 47.4 uh, percent will use their legs as the site of injury for boys it is 30.1 percent that then go to legs for the site of injury and then it changes so um, the next most popular site of injury for girls is then their stomach whereas for the boys it's then the face so for girls it goes arms legs stomach um, other areas which could really be anywhere face and then chest for boys, it goes arms, legs, face, stomach, chest, in terms of uh, the sort of percentage of areas that they're more likely to target. All right, so uh, which is not, so this is now question number four, which is not a common classification for self-harm? A was burning, B was self-poisoning, C, jumping in a way to cause injury or d insomnia the answer is insomnia all right that is not a common classification for self-harming but jumping in a way to cause injury is and that one was new to me um so yeah quite creative i suppose all right so question number five the comorbidity of self-harm with other mental health conditions is thought to be high, true or false. So that's basically saying, what's the likelihood of self-harm existing alongside another mental health condition? Do we think it's high or not high? The answer is, it is high, okay? So we're looking at things like depression, anxiety, and also um, borderline personality disorder, so otherwise known as uh, BPD. So those are like your top three that come alongside self-harming. Um, self-harming is very often a reaction to a some sort of stressor that not coping with certain emotions or stressful situations that are going on around them. So this is why the anxiety and depression levels are likely to be quite high in someone who is self-harming. So on that note, for question number six, where we asked, can you medicate to help to prevent self-harm? The answer is, of course, 
true because we know that we can medicate for things like anxiety, depression, and uh, to some extent, uh, personality disorders as well. So it will be no great surprise to you that the most common way to medicate in order to um, help reduce self-harm would be SSRIs, because these are what are most commonly. Uh, oh, so Frank saying was uh, number five, not a true or false. Um, yeah, so number five was true. The comorbidity of another mental health condition is going to be high, therefore it is true. All right. So um, because SSRIs are most commonly used for um, anxiety and depression, those are going to be probably the most likely go to for medicating to help reduce self-harming. However, um, in some cases, a low dose antipsychotic medication might also be used. Um, this has had some significant reduction in self-harming patterns of behaviour. So that might also be one that shows up. Um, and then also mood stabilizers, such as the ones that are used in bipolar disorder, can also be helpful for reducing self-harming behaviors. So the answer to number six is true on that basis. You can medicate to help to prevent self-harm. Yeah. All right, so question number seven was, diet can help prevent self-harm, true or false? The answer to this one is true. So um, it has been found that, and it's it's loosely true. <laughs> I'll give you that, it's loosely true. So omega-3 fatty acids are known to help reduce suicidal uh, tendencies. And whilst, and I'm sure we'll come to it, um, there isn't necessarily a uh, cause to say that someone who is self-harming is therefore suicidal. Um, there is some connection, as we will come to in just a moment. Um, and so there could be cause to believe, at least. So I would give it to you if you say that it's false, because this isn't carved in stone, but there is certainly good evidence to demonstrate that upping omega-3s and fatty acids in the diet does something with regards to stabilizing mood um, and reduces the tendency to want to self-harm um, or have suicidal tendencies. Alrighty, so on that note, question number eight was, are those who self-harm at a greater risk of suicide? So you remember I said with this one, think very carefully about the question, um, because we know that people who self-harm are not necessarily suicidal. All right. So people self-harm to cope with life rather than because they want to end their life. And there is a quite distinctive difference there, isn't there? However. The question was, are they at a greater risk of suicide? And the answer to that is true. And the reason why is because statistically speaking, because of the harm that they're causing to themselves, the danger that they're putting themselves in, their risk of accidental death is greater. So whether or not you, I guess we could then argue, well, is that still classed as suicide if it's an accidental death? I think if you were to ask a coroner, the answer is yes, it probably would be. Um, so statistically speaking, the risk of accidental death is greater in those who self-harm just because of you know, the risk of the injuries that they're causing to themselves. However, um, they are not necessarily self-harming because they are suicidal. It's just because they want to um, cope with feelings of uh, certain emotional pains um, or just that drive to fulfill the need to release whatever that pressure is that they're experiencing, um, but they're doing it to cope with life, not because they want to end their life. All right, uh, so is self-harming conceptualized as an addiction? A was a yes and B was a no. And the answer is a, yes it is. Um, so it's now commonly referred to as something that is an addictive behaviour. 
Um, so like a lot of other addictions, uh, if you repeat it enough times and it fulfills some kind of emotional need, then an addiction can be created. So it doesn't necessarily go this way for everybody that self harms, um, which is important to mention, but it can go that way. It can become a highly addictive behavior, which means then that part of the treatment for self harming might be along the same lines and in the same vein as we might use with someone who has any other sort of addiction um, and going through some of those cognitive behavioural therapies and strategies uh, to help break down and manage that addiction. All right, so question number 10 was, what does NSSI stand for? So this is a term which is sometimes used in place of self-harm. Sometimes self-harm is also referred to self-injury. Um, so NSSI is either, so we had A, non-suicidal self-injury, B, negative self-sabotage injuries, C, naval scars self-inflicted, or D, non-scarring self-injury? The answer is A, non-suicidal self-injury which goes some way to answering what we were talking about in question eight there about the um, that it's not necessarily got anything to do with being suicidal. OK, so that's why we sometimes use the term NSSI instead of self-harm is to really sort of hammer home that point that this is non-suicidal self-injury. This isn't someone who is suicidal. This is someone who wants to be able to cope with the bad feelings they're experiencing. All right, so question number 11, which was your bonus question, was does the severity of the type of self-harming indicate a worse condition? So we have A for yes and B for no. All right, so in answering this question, I've got a little bit of a rabbit hole to go down. There is an assessment, which is called the NSSI assessment test, which categorizes the different severities of someone's self-harming habits. Um, and it is possible, therefore, to categorize them as low, medium and high severity. So in terms of does the severity indicate a worse condition, in my humble opinion, <laughs> I'm going to say yes, and let me tell you why. So in order for someone to be classed as having a high severity of self-harming, they need to fulfill um, some of these criteria, not necessarily all of them simultaneously, but they're going to be ticking several of these boxes. So for example, uh, the number of times so the number of incidents of self-harming that have happened in their lifetime is more than 11. So if they have self-harmed more than 11 times, that's our first red flag that this could be um, a, an indication of high severity self-harming. If they use three or more forms of self-harming to injure themselves that would be another indicator that they would fulfill the high severity criteria for self-harming so remember no one of these in isolation is going to classify them as high severity it's about how many of these boxes do they tick uh, next one at least one form of the self-harming that they do causes severe tissue damage or broken bones, or uh, something like dripping acid on themselves, or ingesting sharp objects. So basically anything that's really going to get them hospitalised, we would class as being uh, severe damage, and therefore would indicate a higher severity of um, self-harming condition. Um, if they are self-harming, in a pairing with suicidality, eating disorders, physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, or sexual uh, 
abuse or traumas related to physical, emotional or sexual behaviours, then we're going to be looking more toward that high severity area. If they have strong addiction tendencies towards their self-harming, that's going to be another flag. If they have friends who also self-injure, that's also going to be another red flag. And if they hurt themselves more severely than they had originally intended to do, then that too would indicate a higher severity of self-harming. So remember, it's not going to be any one of those things in isolation because maybe someone could hurt themselves more severely than they had intended to the very first time they self-harm and maybe that frightens them, they never do it again. So we wouldn't necessarily classify them as being high severity. However, if we're then pairing that up with one or more of those other high severity indicators, then it starts to flip on over into that high severity of self-harming. So we can most certainly look at the severity of somebody's self-harming um, and see that as being an indicator that they are um, experiencing self-harm to a, a greater level or, you know, it's, it's worse for them because of the risk of injuries that they are inflicting upon themselves is uh, much more severe. And that is pretty much everything I wanted to share with you about self-harming for today. But before I let you go, I will just share with you because I, I actually did a webinar on self-harming probably it's probably a couple of years back now yes do send in your scores um whilst i reel off just a couple more fun facts around self-harm so um there is on the if you go to nlpforkids.org and look at the page there with different um freebies and webinars and downloads and bits and bobs there is actually a self-harm webinar on there i will put a link to it in the youtube description box if you happen to be watching this on the replay um and uh that's a long one and it goes into quite some detail so here's just some bits and bobs that came out of that one um so the reason why children and teenagers self-harm is often complicated and can differ from one child to the next sometimes they may not know themselves why they do it. And sometimes this is something that does become a bit of a trend amongst a cluster of young people um, where they see someone else is doing it and, and for them it works as a way to be able to cope with their emotions. Maybe that's something I could be doing too. Um, often the reasons are to cope with negative feelings, to control um, or punish themselves. Self-harming can also appear to be a way to relieve unwanted feelings by reducing tension or distracting away from the emotional pain by having the experience of physical pain instead. Uh, some experiences or emotions can make self-harm more likely to happen. Self-harm can include behaviours such as cuts, bruises, biting, burning, head banging, trichotillomania, um, inserting objects into the body or taking overdoses are all forms of self-harm. Um, and some clues if you are ever concerned about self-harming is unexplained injuries, uh, a young person keeping themselves covered up and avoiding changing clothes in front of people being isolated or withdrawn, blood-stained clothes, emotional outbursts, expressing feelings of failure. Again, no one of those things in isolation is going to be the master key to tell us this. Um, it's about putting the pieces together um, and opening up those communication channels to find out what might really be going on. All right, so let's have a look at your scores. Okay, Paula Emmons got nine out of 11, very respectable, very good. I'm interested to know which ones did you not get? Um, Frank, seven, seven's good, Frank. That doesn't require a sad face now. Um, and Ian was also a nine out of 11, same score as Paula. Oh, so I wonder which ones for you guys uh, caught you out. There were a couple of curveballs in there. Um, one of the other things, actually, I remember from doing the self-harm webinar a couple of years back is I had a misconception 
with self-harm, but this was quite a new phenomena, you know, almost a bit like a bit of a trendy one. Um, and actually this goes right back to the Victorian era and there is a documentation, so this is in the late 19th century, two American doctors had written up um, their findings around women in Europe who punctured themselves with sewing needles and that's believed to be the sort of most early recorded phenomena around self-harming or at least um, it, where it's actually classified in a way of sort of self-injury. All right so Paula said I got one and 17 wrong so okay so one was the stats one from Childline yeah surprisingly low that um, and the diet one okay and Ian got one and nine nine was the addiction one interesting all right, well, I think you all got very respectable scores there. I don't think that that's anything to be embarrassed about. Frank got one, oh, one really caught you all out, didn't it? Um, five, six, and 11. So five was your one about um, the comorbidity. Uh, six was the medications. Yep, so the SSRIs. To be fair, I think that the study numbers around that are relatively low. But um, and a, another thing, actually, I should mention with things like SSRIs and certainly antipsychotics, the likelihood of a young person being prescribed that medication is not very high at all. Um, so obviously, we're mainly talking about young people who are self-harming for the purposes of our webinars um, and this series, but there are adults who go on um, and continue to self-harm as well. So uh, with regards to the medications, it's not something we would commonly see being prescribed to children and young people um, because they just don't like to prescribe those sorts of mood stabilizers and things like that necessarily. Number 11 was the severity one, yeah, which was quite a complex one, so that is fair enough. All right, well, I'm proud of you all. I think you did a smashing job there. Um, so I hope that you learned something this evening, that you got something helpful out of that. I will include a link to that previous webinar that I mentioned, so if you'd like to go learn more about self-harming, then you will be able to do so. But for now, I shall thank you all for spending the evening with me and tomorrow is the uh, webinar for developing a good routine and then um, Wednesday's one is coping with playing uh, two roles look out for the emails that come out to you because there is another webinar I think we had someone off poorly sick last week so we owe you an extra one and we won't let you down there will be another bonus one on the way you are very welcome Paula thank you all for being here this evening and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening Take care, everyone. Bye.